Lecture 25, More Concurrency in File Systems. Now, thus far, when we've talked about modification of shared data, we follow a model that you could describe as lock, modify, then unlock. Uh, so this is fairly straightforward. You know, you acquire a lock to you know, restrict access to the resource that you want to uh, operate on. While you have that resource locked, then you are allowed to make modifications. You make the modifications that you need to make. Uh, and then when you are done, you unlock it, thus allowing another thread to have its turn. Uh, and that works reasonably well. Um, we are sort of quite familiar uh, with how that works, but we are also at this point um, certainly familiar with another kind of concurrency. Uh, and uh, if you've used Git, uh, which I mean at, at this point you should have uh, for uh, for the assignments in the course. Um, on the off chance that you are deciding you want to binge watch all of the um, videos uh, in advance of the first one, then maybe you haven't yet. Uh, maybe you've used Git on a co-op term, maybe you've used subversion uh, on a co-op term, that would also be a uh, similar thing. Uh, it's a version control system that follows the model copy, modify, merge. Let's take a minute to talk about that. So you and your lab partner uh, want to work on something together. I mean, how do you go about that? Well, I mean, there's you know the uh, approach of uh, you know only one person is working on it at a time. Um, that is um, maybe not optimal, but it is you know suitable um, you know in a uh, in a world in which you can work on the labs together at the same physical location. You can make it so that you know, although both of you are present and both of you are contributing, only one person is typing on the keyboard at a given time. Uh, and that would work. That would be somewhat like the lock modify unlock uh, in that you are you know taking a turn. However, you don't have to do that, and you probably, again, on a co-op term, if you worked uh, in software, don't see that. What you see instead is the idea that people make their changes, uh, and they make their changes locally you know, on their own machine, and then they try to bring it back together uh, at the end. So with Git, you check out a repository, your lab partner does the same thing, you make your changes, and then you try to merge your changes. So you try to apply them to the uh, central repository, to the original source. Now, perhaps uh, you are successful, in which case um, we don't have to do anything extra, just your changes are applied and that's it. Uh, perhaps you're unsuccessful because there was another change that is in conflict with the change that you want to make. Uh, and if that's the case, you'll be told, sorry, um, that's not going to be allowed. You have to fix the conflicts before this change is allowed to proceed. Regardless though, um, when we are making changes, the changes always go as a package, uh, and um, when changes are applied, we have to make sure that a package either succeeds entirely uh, and nothing is left as half done. And for that, we have the concept of the transaction. So a transaction is a grouping of operations that belong together and should be treated as uh, an indivisible unit. Um, and as we know um, from you know, a great deal of discussion on the subject of concurrency, bad things happen when an intermediate state of a multi-step operation becomes inadvertently visible. And most of the examples looked at something like X++, where you know, what happens if another thread wants to read or write X at the same time? Does that potentially result in someone seeing a wrong answer or somebody's changes being overwritten? That kind of thing is, uh, is what we've considered thus far. But in the copy, modify, merge scenario, um, everybody makes their changes separately and then we try to put them all together. Now a transaction has a begin transaction statement, so it denotes the beginning of the transaction and says, okay, so the following steps are all part of the same transaction. Then there is a list of operations. This is what we want to do. So these are the file changes that we want to make or the data changes that we want to make. Uh, and then there is an end transaction statement that says transaction that we started earlier is now finished. Now that's the end of all of the statements that belong to this transaction. <laughs> 
Okay, um, and uh, this allows the transaction to be processed you know, in a meaningful way. I said that we have to make sure that things don't get left half done. Well, that's what writing all the steps down is for. If all the steps are written down in advance, uh, then we could figure out, did we accomplish all the steps that we were supposed to do? Uh, if uh, they're not written down, then we don't know necessarily if we're finished. So that's kind of why it is the way that it is. Now, execution of a transaction looks something like write down the transaction into a log. So we're going to you know, write our plans down, in this case, so on a stable form of storage, usually hard drive or solid state drive or something, something will survive a crash or reboot. Uh, and then we will try to carry out the operations in the transaction uh, and you know, just go through them one at a time in exactly the order that we wrote them down until we get to the end transaction statement. And when we get to the end transaction statement, if everything has thus far gone well, the transaction is marked as successful. However, um, sometimes in life you are... Uh, so write down all the things we need to do, then actually do them, realize something went wrong, we have to go back and undo it and try again. And it's that last one, which uh, we've already introduced actually, the idea behind it, and that is a rollback, uh, that we need to be concerned about when we have a transaction. Uh, and yeah, if that's the case, if we try to apply a set of changes, so we have five files that are being changed uh, in this commit uh, and we find out that someone has changed one of those files in a way that's incompatible with our uh, with our changes then we will you know just go back we will uh, roll back so undo any changes that we did uh, and well we have to uh, try again now, try again in the sense of version control, as you'll be told most likely that, um, the, that you have to resolve this conflict manually. There is an automatic merging procedure, so there is an automatic conflict resolution procedure, uh, and it might succeed or it might not. Um, but in other contexts, sometimes just try again uh, happens automatically with no user intervention necessary. So in the case of version control, um, you know, we're notified uh, about what happened, even if it's just, you know, here's for your information. Um, but in other contexts like the database, we don't actually get told that at all. You know, we will just uh, see the transaction goes through, and maybe if we're very observant, we notice it took a little longer uh, than normal. Uh, now, of course, in a file system, the last write wins. Uh, you know, if two uh, processes want to write to the same file, you know, whoever gets their last uh, might overwrite someone else. So, obviously, you have to use proper coordination uh, for this to work. So, you might be wondering, why are we talking about copy, modify, merge? Why is this relevant? Uh, what, what does this have to do with um, concurrency, really? It's kind of another form of concurrency, but uh, it's not dramatically different than what we saw, and why do transactions and what have you matter? The answer to why this is really relevant um, outside of the context of this course is databases. Uh, if you take a databases course in the future, uh, then you will spend a lot of time actually thinking about and talking about transactions uh, in the context of the database. Uh, and the database is trying its best to execute all of your transactions you know, as quickly as possible, respecting the fact that we have to deal with conflicts. Uh, and so for this topic, there is quite a lot of um, research and a lot of nuance as to how transactions are actually uh, carried out and how they're executed. Uh, in particular, uh, in the face of things like, well, what happens if the database crashes in the middle of a transaction? How do we recover from that inconsistent state? Um, all those kinds of things uh, are covered in, uh, in your future databases course, should you have one. Uh, and it does come with my recommendation uh, as uh, an interesting course uh, if you want to read up on it then uh, by all means. Uh, we're not really going to focus in this course uh, on the concept of the database, uh, but I just want you to be able to make that connection if you take it in the future uh, between the idea of uh, concurrency control uh, and the database transaction mechanism. So we will uh, leave this off 
uh, here, and this and that sentence being our discussion of the database and the copy, modify, merge model. Um, but we'll see it has some other applications in file systems uh, in, in just a little bit. But our uh, next thing that we want to talk about uh, is uh, iNotify. Uh, and I am an inbox zero kind of person, so uh, this this picture hurts to look at. I mean, at present, I, I have three unread emails in my inbox, and they're like staring at me being like, come on, we need you to do this thing. Um, even though you know, none of them is a big deal. Uh, and I could do them, but I'm busy doing something else, so I will get back to them. But anyway... Continuing on, um, what is iNotify? Well, it's another way to use the file system in Linux only. This is not standards compliant, so you won't find it in other Unix-like operating systems. Uh, is, uh, but it's a way we can use the file system for synchronization or concurrency control uh, in that you can wait for certain things to happen and be notified when that occurs. So using the API, you register your program as being interested in an event. Uh, and uh, when that event happens, you get notified, hey, the event you were waiting for happened. So you say you want to watch a particular file or a directory, and when an event occurs, your program is informed. Okay, we don't have a super strong definition of what an event is, so we're going to have to come back to that. Um, and uh, I remind you again, this is not portable, Linux only. But okay, um, here's how we watch something using iNotify, uh, which is number one, use an initialization function to create a management structure, and you get a file descriptor as the return value from that, so you can refer to the management structure. Okay, then you tell the kernel what files you're interested in by adding them to the structure. Again, using file descriptors here. Uh, and you can also remove them if you lose interest in a particular thing for some reason. Uh, and to collect an event, you use read on a file descriptor. Uh, each uh, call returns one or more uh, of the event structures. And when you're done, you close the file descriptor representing the management structure, which conveniently cleans up everything for you. Um, okay. Uh, and it's also uh, noted on the slide here that the mechanism is uh, not recursive. So if you add a directory, it covers the file in that directory, but not the subdirectories. Now, maybe this workflow makes a bit more sense uh, if we actually take a look at some of the API calls uh, and their definitions. So we'll start with uh, the initialization one. So the function for this is I notify init, uh, and it returns an int. The int, as it was in so many cases, is a file descriptor. So it returns a file descriptor that is used to reference the I notify management structure that we are going to use. It doesn't require any arguments, so it is quite convenient in that sense. I don't have to uh, explain a whole bunch of, you know, here's how you fill in these arguments or anything. It's just straightforward. Just create me one, please. Then, if you want to add something to the list that we are watching, there is I notify add watch, uh, and it takes a file descriptor, uh, a uh, const jar, path name, uh, and a mask. Okay, this one isn't as easy. This one requires more explaining. Okay, so to add an item, uh, the first argument, FD, this is the iNotify structure. So that is the one that we just got back from iNotify init, uh, and that's how we have, uh, that's how we refer to it um, by its file descriptor, and that's why it's provided here. The second argument is the name, you know, in string format of the file that you want to add to the list that we are going to watch. Uh, and it is necessary to have at least read permission on the file to be able to watch it. You can't watch you know, other people's files or you know, root system files that you don't have access to. Um, but if you want to be notified, then you can add it here uh, by its file name. And the mask argument is how we specify the details about the events that we are interested in. We're going to uh, just 
put a pin in that for now because we're going to come back to that. Uh, what, are, what are the kinds of events that we're interested in and um, how, how are they defined? Um, but just for the moment, um, mask is how you specify the details. Uh, and if you're already watching a file, then calling add with a different mask then replaces the mask with a new one. Uh, in case you, know, you want different details, then that's an option. Uh, and uh, this returns, uh, well, an integer value, uh, and you should uh, save this because you're going to need this value. It's how iNotify will um, remove a file if you are uh, planning to stop watching it at some point, then you need to hang on to this because that's how you, uh, the return value is the uh, value that you need to tell uh, iNotify to remove. Speaking of remove, here is the functionality for remove. Uh, the function is it just uh, remove watch, uh, a file descriptor, and then wd. So file descriptor, again, is our iNotify uh, management structure, the one we got back from iNotify init. Uh, and wd, in this case, is the watch descriptor. Uh, and that is what is actually returned by iNotify add watch. It returns an integer, and the integer is an unsigned 32-bit integer. Uh, and it is officially named the watch descriptor. So, okay. To start watching a file, you have to have an iNotify uh, in its structure. You add the file that you want to watch, uh, and when you do so, it returns the watch descriptor. When you're done watching that file, uh, then you can, well, then you can just um, remove it with uh, notify watch. Or if you're done watching files entirely, then you can just, you know, close the iNotify structure. You'll notice um, that there is, uh, you know, there's a, an init, but there's no destroy or cleanup function for it. Why? Because it's a file descriptor, and when you're done with it, you just close it in the same way that, you know, pipe, uh, you just close the files that are created by it. Um, sockets, you just call close on them. Files, you call close on them. Same with the iNotify descriptor. It will figure out what it needs to do. Okay, so um, events. Uh, mm, TV has so many channels. Turns out there are about 23 different events that you can watch for using the bit mask. Uh, so the, the mask variable uh, can be put together in lots of ways. I'm showing you on the slide a highlight because some of them are quite obscure and are maybe not super useful or just good for corner cases. But these are the ones that uh, I'll just highlight for now. So the bit value for um, say uh, it, uh, all of the um, all of the uh, fields here begin with in underscore because it's for i notify. So access uh, if the file is accessed, so it's read uh, or executed, then that event is said to occur. Uh, attributes uh, is next one. So if the metadata is changed, someone has changed the permissions on it, that triggers um, the event. For I notify uh, file uh, open for writing was closed. File open for, uh, not for writing was closed. Um, create, delete, delete self, modify, uh, open, uh, and then there's all of the above. Now, if we choose all events, you get notified about every kind of event, including ones that are not listed here. Uh, again, if you want to see all of them, uh, it's easy enough to check the full specification. There's a lot. You can uh, you can watch for obscure things, but we'll stick to this set uh, in, in our discussion. Now, imagine that you have some files set up that you want to watch. So I've told you how to set it up. I've told you, um, you know, how to add files to be watched and, uh, and remove them if we're done, but not actually how to notice that an event has occurred. Uh, and for that, we need to actually read on the file descriptor for the iNotify. So again, reusing a function we already know how to read. So that's easy. Uh, when ready for such an event, so events can occur whether we're ready or not. Uh, if events have already occurred, when we call read, we just collect the data immediately. Uh, if events are not yet ready, uh, then if we call read, because it's a blocking call, we will be blocked until there is some data to read, until some event has occurred. Uh, and if event has occurred, what you'll read is a structure called inotify event. Now, inotify event is 
uh, the description of it is, uh, well, just five fields. There is a watch descriptor, so that tells us uh, what file it came from, if that's uh, important to us. You might not care about the watch descriptor if you're only watching one file, then of course you know immediately which one it came from, so you know, no cause for concern there. Uh, there is a mask, there is a cookie, uh, there is a length, and there is a name. Okay, so what's up with that? Um, the watch descriptor, uh, as I've described previously, uh, is uh, you know the file descriptor the event happened on. The second tells you the kind of event that has occurred. So you can look at that and you can say you know compare that against our table. You know if, if the event is equal to um, in underscore create, it means a file was created in the directory that we're watching, and we know that to be uh, the kind of event. Cookie. Um, uh, here's a pop-up. Would you like to accept cookies? Um, no, cookie is uh, used to associate related events, uh, and that's mostly for rename. So if you rename a file, that's actually reported as two different events, um, and it's reported as the old file goes away uh, and the new file is created, uh, and the cookie is used to link those two. So if you're watching for um, events in this folder and you see there was a deletion and an addition, if they have the same cookie value, it means that was a renaming and not actually that a file was deleted and a new one was created. So it is something to watch for. Um, it is, well, it's one strategy for linking the two together. You might think that might not be the best strategy. Um, you know, it might have been better to... Um, might have been better to do something different, but this is the API that we're stuck with. Uh, and then we have the length, uh, and the length here is the size of the name field, so the one that comes after it. And then we have a character array name, uh, an optional null terminated name. So might be present, might be not, but... Hmm. Wait a minute. Something is um, not quite right here. The size of an iNotify event uh, is the structure size plus the length of the array. Um, and the array is you know, of potentially arbitrary size. I mean, it won't be infinitely huge, but it, you know, we don't know the size in advance. So that makes it kind of hard. How many bytes are we going to try to read? I mean, you know, we, know, we know the size of the structure. No, we we could work that out. You know, size of this um, you know, mass cookie length or whatever. What is the size of the name? We don't know that in advance. I mean, usually when we do a read, we know how many bytes we would like to read, right? Even if we're just reading a chunk of a file and we're going to process this many bytes at a time, we say, yep, yeah, that's the size of the buffer. That's what I'm going to read. How do we choose the size of the buffer now? Right? Now, to... To know that, we would have to have some data already read so we could get to the length. So how do we get there? I want you to think about it for a minute. Any ideas? Yeah, this is your uh, standard clairvoyance problem. So how do we go about it? Well, one approach is make the buffer really big. You know, um, the length of the data we get back uh, is limited to a certain extent uh, by the names of the files that we are watching. So if you know the maximum length of a file name that you're watching, you know the maximum size that this structure could be. Um, so, you know, just conclude, okay, well, you know, the, the size of the regular elements, so the int, the un32s, and then the maximum file length plus one, Remember to make space for the null terminator. Uh, if your buffer isn't big enough, then the read call will fail, uh, in which case you will be notified, yep, uh, that didn't uh, go as expected. You know, we, we didn't read any data. That mm, works, and you might see that in a uh, simple example, one that we might do uh, in the course, but it's not real great for actual, you know, production code. Uh, so what will we do for that? Well, we could ask. Consult an expert. Uh, let, let me check my crystal ball. Um, 
I mean, clearly the cat is an expert in this subject, right? I mean, just look at it. Um, no, uh, what we can do is ask. Um, and the function IOControl, I-O-C-T-L, can tell you what you want to know. Uh, and more or less you can ask with this, IOControl is tremendously complicated. It does a billion things like several other um, important Unix functions. Uh, but the function that we need it to do here is to ask how many bytes are available to read. Uh, and it can do that. Um, so if you call uh, IO control with the file descriptor and the constant um, file read, uh, file on read, however you want to pronounce that allowed, uh, it will file IO uh, number to read, I believe is where it actually comes from, uh, will uh, tell you how many bytes are available to read from a file, or in this case, an inotify instance. Uh, and it takes a pointer to uh, a integer that it's going to update with the size uh, and so you just pass in you know address of the int that you want to update uh, and it will be updated with the size of the data that's available to read now the thing is that if your buffer is big enough you could actually get more than one event returned to you uh, in one read you might consider that to be efficient um, so you do have to be a little bit careful if the like number of bytes that you're are expecting to read is somehow quite large you can uh, check that over and you can see well uh, is is it the case that um, the data that I'm looking for is one or more than one uh, of these I notify descriptors um, so yeah let's do a quick example uh, of I notify this one is going to use uh, a file uh, for the purposes of a lock. If you recall from a previous um, discussion about using files for locking, i.e. in the um, in the most recent past topic, uh, where we discussed the idea of um, Git using a, a structure index.lock uh, file uh, as a way of representing whether or not multiple Git repositories, uh, multiple Git clients were trying to operate on the same repository. Um, now we can improve on that a little bit uh, in that we are going to wait for the file to, uh, to um, be gone. Uh, in the previous example, what does git do? Well, it checks to see if the file exists you know, by trying to create it. And if we fail, then git exits and it says, sorry, the index.lock already exists, so quitting. That's fine. Um, maybe you don't want that behavior, actually. Maybe what you want uh, is that instead of quitting, uh, git waits its turn. Okay, um, so you could uh, you know, do that in a loop with sleep or something, but that wouldn't be optimal because we'd waste a lot of time trying unnecessarily. Uh, what we will attempt to do with inotify is something more along the lines of, well, when that file is deleted, let us know, and then we'll see if it's our turn. So let's get started. Um, so in this case, I've named the file file.lock. You could, of course, name it anything you want. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, named anything in particular. Uh, and we will declare uh, a lockfd uh, as an integer, and then a Boolean variable our turn is false. Um, and this Boolean variable will be used to control when we break out of the loop. Okay, so in the loop, we will attempt to open the file in question. So file name, file.lock, uh, and we will open it with the flags create and exclusive, which again, as we covered last time, means attempt to create the file. Uh, and if the file already exists, this should fail. Okay, then um, if we read the return value, if lockfd is negative one, it means we failed. Uh, and I added a printf message here that just adds a little bit of um, extra information if you take this code and run it to give you an idea. Uh, and it says the lock file exists and then process and then uh, percent %ld is a uh, long uh, integer. Uh, and it will wait its turn. Uh, and then we get our PID uh, using the get PID function. I'm not sure we covered the get PID um, function previously, uh, but it is very straightforward. It takes no arguments and it returns the process ID of the process that called it. Uh, so in this case, it's just a nice little printout that says um, we're going to um, uh, we're going to wait, uh, allowing you if you had multiple of these running just to have a better insight into what the code is actually doing. 
Okay, um, so we've decided we're going to wait. So what we'll do is set up the inotify. So we'll create uh, the inotify file descriptor with inotify init. We will then uh, create uh, the watch descriptor by calling add watch uh, with notify fd, the one we just created with inotify init, uh, the file name, uh, and then the event that we are waiting for is delete self. So when the file that we have asked to watch is deleted, that is what we are watching for. Okay, um, that, um, so the delete self, I mean, it looks a little strange to add it because you might think self is referring to something other than the file name, but that's the uh, correct constant for it. So that's what we're interested in watching. Uh, and we're storing the watch descriptor in the variable watched. Okay, then um, because we're looking for exactly one file and we know the length, we're not going to use the more complicated mechanism where we ask IO control to tell us the length of the file. What we're going to do instead is just use the string length of the file name uh, and then add one. The string length function is, of course, slightly dangerous when you're looking at a string if you know, we're not sure it's null terminated. In this case, we know it is because file name is declared at compile time a constant, so uh, you know, nobody has messed with it, so we know the length will be reasonable and the null terminator will exist because the compiler will kindly put it in for you. But in any case, our buffer size is the size of the struct I notify event plus the length of the file name plus one, the plus one for the null terminator. Uh, and then we have our uh, event buffer, which is malloced. Uh, and I added again another printf that says, okay, setup complete. We are waiting for an event. Uh, and then we will do a read. And the read is blocking. So you know, until the event has occurred, that is until that file is deleted, uh, and you know, deletion generates an event, but until that happens, we will be blocked on the read until some data is ready. Uh, and so this is a way to efficiently wait for the condition or the event that we are interested in, uh, even though we're just sort of operating based on the file system alone. So that would be you would probably imagine better than the git approach of just give up uh, or some sort of spin lock, you know, try again uh, immediately approach. Okay, so once we've woken up from the read, uh, then we know that the event has occurred and the data was read into the buffer. Uh, it would technically be correct to uh, check the return value of read to see if we read the correct amount uh, of data. That's cut off uh, in this example because I kind of needed to crush it down a little bit to fit on this slide, um, but it would be a good idea to check the return value of read. Uh, and what we're going to do here is the data is uh, in the buffer and we're going to just interpret the buffer as a pointer to struct I notify event. Uh, and so we're going to um, just cast it. I'll, uh, I'll go back. So I allocated the buffer here, event buffer as char star of uh, malloc buffer size. You could uh, obviously save a step uh, where again, you have the struct I notify event star as your type instead of char star. This um, will do the same thing and all, all that's needed uh, is a pointer and malloc returns a void pointer and read should be able to put it anywhere. Um, but you might occasionally get a compiler that hassles you about such a thing um, because it says, well, I'm not sure that the type is the correct type. So uh, for that reason, uh, I just uh, usually allocate a buffer as character. Uh, and then now we're just going to reinterpret it by saying, pretend it is now with this. And C says, yes, it is now with that. Um, that is straightforward. Uh, and I have a printf here that says event occurred. So after we have woken up, we could look at the event if we want and then make decisions about what to do. In this first example, it's not necessary because all we were waiting for was the occurrence of the event and there was only one file and there was only one type of event. So there's no decision to be made about what to do uh, and therefore uh, just printf and then we'll clean up. So we deallocate the buffer, uh, we remove the watch uh, and then we close the notify 
file descriptor. I believe it is the case that we don't actually have to remove the watch. Uh, it, we could just proceed straight to close uh, on notify FD. But I wanted to include an example of using that uh, just so you could see it uh, in practice. Uh, and then uh, that will... Uh, uh, and that will suffice. So then we will go around, we'll skip the else block, and we'll do the next iteration of the loop. Uh, and that is, we'll go back to while not our turn, which remains false, then we'll try to acquire this lock by opening the file again, exclusive and create. Now, wait a minute, you might say, why aren't we going on to you know, the critical area where it's protected by the file lock? Thing is that multiple file, uh, multiple processes could be watching the same file. And if that's the case, everybody gets notified when the lock file gets deleted. So if there are three processes that are you know, waiting their turn, it's not just that one gets notified, it's that everybody gets notified. And that means that we have to try again to acquire the lock to make sure that it is in fact our turn. So if we do, then we can you know, skip this if lock FD is negative one, uh, block and we go straight to the else block. However, we might be unlucky and we might get negative one a second time, in which case, well, we do that whole procedure. We wait for the next process to be finished before we uh, can try again. But we will, we'll imagine, succeed. Uh, and uh, what's going to happen? Well, uh, we'll open the, uh, so uh, we'll open the file. We will succeed. That means we go to the else block. Uh, and here we have, uh, again, we're going to malloc a buffer uh, of size 32. Uh, we're going to uh, then, uh, well, memset this to be uh, zero. Uh, we will then uh, do a string uh, print here of PID into a string that's just the uh, long uh, integer descriptor for get PID. Uh, and so we took our process ID number and we turned it into a string. Uh, and sprintf returns the number of bytes that the new string is. Uh, and we're then going to write that into the lock file. Then we can free the buffer and we can close the lock file. Uh, and we can conclude it is then our turn. What's that about? Um, this is not technically necessary. All that would really have to happen in the else block is our turn is assigned true or just break out of the loop uh, or something to that effect. Um, what the writing your process ID is about is a convention that you sometimes see in Unix. If you remember when we talked about inter-process communication, uh, I said that sometimes it's the case that a process writes its process ID into a well-known location. Uh, MySQL was an example of that, that if you look in a, in a particular directory, in a particular file, MySQL writes down its process ID in that file so that other processes that want to find it know what its process ID is. Uh, and that is a similar idea of what we are doing here. Uh, we, as the process that wrote uh, our process ID in there, we're saying we have the lock. Uh, and so if the system crashes, if our process is killed, uh, if something bad happens, then it makes it a little easier for an administrator or someone to see that, oh, the file lock was created by a process that doesn't exist anymore and that it's safe to remove. If we look in that uh, lock file, we can also see which process is using it. And if that process still exists, then you could say, well, it might still be running, so I'll let it have some more time. Or you might conclude that it's stuck because it's held this lock for an unreasonable amount of time. Um, either way, it gives us a lot more information about what process created this file. Uh, and absent that, it could be harder to figure out as administrator sort of what the right thing to do is, uh, whether something it needs to be killed, whether it's safe to delete this file. So it's polite, and that's why we do that here. Okay, once we've uh, actually concluded it's our turn and we've written down, all right, it's our turn, uh, then we get to a printf statement that says, okay, this process is in the area protected by the file lock. This is where you would actually do whatever operation. Um, so if it is git and we are trying to you know, pull changes from the remote repository, this is where the pull would actually happen. Um, I've left that out because we're not actually interested in that in this example. Uh, all that we are really interested in is the idea 
idea of um, you know being in that critical section. Uh, and then finally, we have a remove call that deletes the lock file, uh, and that again sends a message to anybody and everybody who's waiting uh, to tell them the event of deletion of that file has occurred. Okay, so we're going to transition a little bit to really the last thing that I want to talk about uh, when it comes to uh, the idea of concurrency, uh, and that is consistency checking and journaling. So this ties into the idea of concurrency in file systems uh, because, well, we're talking about consistency and journaling of file systems. That is how they make sure they're in a consistent state. Uh, you could apply the same thing to database transactions uh, if, if you wish. Uh, and uh, ultimately, um, because there is the possibility of having sort of multiple things in progress at the same time, it does intersect with concurrency. Uh, somewhat. Uh, so it is perhaps a little bit of a digression to talk about like file systems uh, in, in this detail, uh, but you can see how it is tied in to the other topics uh, that we've covered so far. Now, um, when we are you know, using the computer, any number of bad things can and will happen. Uh, an error, a crash, a power failure, anything like that could result in either loss of data uh, or inconsistent data in your file system. Uh, and this is because directory structures, pointers, inodes, all those things, they're all data structures, and if they become corrupted, uh, it can lead to serious problems uh, in that you know, we just don't get the correct results our file contains garbage, a program crashes when we try to open a file. Um, so yeah, we might need to check for consistency. Uh, and as the saying goes, all food must go to the lab for testing. Now, you could check for uh, inconsistency, you know, periodically. So like when the system boots up uh, and many operating systems do that. Um, if you need to do a full check, that's actually very time consuming. A brief check uh, can be um, relatively fast uh, just to see, you know, are there were there any open transactions uh, at the time of boot up? If that's the case, then something is wrong and we have to check it. Um, but like a full total scan to check for consistency consistency all throughout the file system uh, is very expensive uh, as you have to you know, read all the files on disk and check that their information is valid. The tool uh, in Windows is called Check Disk or Scan Disk. Uh, in Unix, uh, it is File System Check. Uh, I, I maybe shouldn't say the uh, abbreviation uh, out loud. Uh, and it looks for an inconsistent state, so a file that claims to be 12 blocks, but the linked list contains only 5, uh, and will attempt to repair it. Now, you might not be happy with the nature of the repair, because the nature of repair might be, well, um, it says it's 12 blocks, but I can only find 5, so 5 is the correct size of the file. Uh, and you might be thinking, but where did my other 7 blocks go? Uh, and uh, that is, well... That's how file system uh, check and repair routines work. They're interested in making sure the file system is in a consistent state. They're not necessarily interested in making sure the maximum amount of data is recovered or even that you are particularly happy as a user. So uh, yeah, sometimes we are disappointed with an outcome, uh, but it's okay as far as the system is concerned because it means that we are back in a consistent state. So uh, that is to say, in other words, there are levels of success and a level of success uh, depends on the nature of the problem and the implementation of the file system. Um, now you want to prevent the system from being in an inconsistent state and the goal is to, of course, use transactions. Um, and pretty much every modern uh, file system uh, uses transactions to ensure consistency. Um, we're going to talk specifically about ZFS, uh, APFS, and NTFS. And these are file systems developed by uh, Sun Microsystems, now Oracle, uh, Apple, uh, and Microsoft, respectively. Uh, and they are all different. Uh, each of them has something interesting to offer uh, that we, uh, we will examine in this case. We'll start um, with ZFS. Uh, my natural inclination, of course, is to pronounce it like Z, um, but uh, you may uh, 
you may notice that I do that. Um, it's, yep. If I get that wrong, know what I mean. I'm given to understand the official pronunciation is ZFS. Uh, and ZFS uses the idea of transactions, making sure that your state is always consistent on disk. Uh, and the goal is to use more or less the copy modify merge model. So if you want to make a change, then a copy of the blocks is made, the copy is changed, uh, and then you just update pointers uh, to uh, where they need to go. Uh, and blocks are never therefore overwritten with new data. Instead, a transaction always writes stuff to new blocks. Uh, then references to old blocks are replaced with the location of the new ones, and the old ones can be cleaned up, reused, disposed of, that sort of thing. Um, and so um, there is an interesting weakness to this. Uh, if a disk becomes completely full and like totally absolutely 100% full, it's not possible to delete anything and make space because there's no place to allocate new blocks. That's a problem and not just a hypothetical. It happened to a friend of mine when he tried to put too much data on his uh, network attached storage and he was mad, but he was going to buy a new one anyway, but he was still kind of mad. So that's one, of, that's one way that ZFS tries to ensure consistency. That is, you always write into new blocks so things won't be left half done. What about uh, APFS, uh, the Apple file system? Uh, before this, Apple used um, HPFS plus, um, but uh, more recently they've gone to uh, APFS, the Apple file system. Uh, and uh, like some version control systems, it brings in the ability to take snapshots of the file system. So instead of, uh, you know, just old data is gone, uh, when you overwrite a file, uh, then you know, the old data is gone and all you have is the new data. APFS allows you to have some sort of like in-place uh, rollback ability where you can go back to a previous version of a file and you can say, well, you know, looking at this file, um, because a diff is stored, that is only the changes are stored, you could just you know, apply or uh, revert that diff. Uh, and put the file back in the state that it was. So you wrote some stuff in a document and uh, you wanted to go back, you know, throw it away, well, the old state of the document is there. Um, but this is nice. You know, only new things really sort of take up space and diffs are usually fairly small as compared to the you know, actual file. Again, if you are, you're writing a 300-page document and you wrote one page today, the diff that you added today is small compared to uh, the size of the document and the total space isn't really affected very much. Um, and it's potentially quite helpful for taking backups because one of the ways that you can you know, take backups is you have a base file and then you have all the diffs uh, and there is a little bit of work to apply the changes, uh, the diffs to each file um, but you know, you're trading off effectively um, some more time for using less space. Uh, and that's helpful for taking backups because you don't have to figure out uh, quite so much about what's changed. You already have that built into the file system. I mean, you do take backups, right? You really should. Um, you do not want to be uh, a friend of mine. A friend of mine for want of a $100 uh, hard drive, you, know, you buy one of those um, external hard drives, USB connection, uh, quite cheaply on Amazon, uh, lost a whole bunch of important data and pictures. Uh, and uh, when she looked into uh, data recovery services, data recovery services, you know, starting price is like $1,000, so 10 times cost, uh, with no guarantees about what, if anything, they're going to recover. Because, you know, they have to open up the drive in the clean room and try replacing the hardware and everything. It's bad. Don't be like that take backups. Um, backups are cheap uh, compared to recovery. So yeah, that's my rant. You should, um, you should take backups. All right, so speedier backups do sort of work uh, in this regard. Um, and uh, and uh, it's 
helpful in that regard, although it does decrease performance you know, while backups are being taken uh, because you can compute a diff between the backup copy and the current. Uh, and you can think about um, whether or not that should happen sort of on an ongoing basis or only exactly when a backup is being taken. Um, the Apple approach is faster uh, and you can replay changes as needed to get back to a consistent, and this slide should say state, at the end of it. So uh, you might uh, not have everything, but you might have you know, everything except the last change, uh, and that would be uh, better than nothing. Um, now, uh, one thing that APFS does that uh, actually potentially harms uh, what I would call the most common backup system for non-technical users, like if, if you asked uh, someone who was truly non-technical to take a backup, they would say, well, what I'm going to do is take a copy and I'm going to put it in a different folder. You know, so just in case, I mean, it doesn't guard against hard drive failure or anything, uh, but it does guard against what if, um, you know, the file gets uh, gets lost because you know, that sector of the drive is damaged. That doesn't happen all that much anymore. You know, we're uh, in, in the modern age, perhaps not as worried about it as we used to be. Um, in that, well, if there was a power failure, what if the you know, head of the hard drive crashes into the platter? I mean, that doesn't happen so much anymore with solid state drives. But you could imagine, uh, I think, if you had a solid state drive, like what if there was you know, some hardware failure of some part of the data where your uh, file is stored? Um, so, yeah, APFS doesn't actually duplicate data if it's on the same volume. They think they're doing you a favor if you think of it as just reducing wasted space. Um, but from the perspective of redundancy, it sucks because if uh, that part of the disk is damaged, then all of the copies uh, are lost because they're all referring back to the same physical location uh, on your storage media. So, uh, give and take. Some compromise. Now, uh, somewhat like uh, ZFS, uh, the Apple approach to avoiding inconsistent data is something like copy on write, but they were not very clear about what it means. Um, the lead developer uh, of this, Dominic Giampaolo, says it's a novel copy on write metadata scheme, but also somehow not exactly the same as the ZFS single atomic update approach. I don't know what to make of that. Um, it's hard to tell behind the marketing speak if it's just, you know, very similar to ZFS or it's the same as ZFS uh, with you know, just a slightly different uh, code implementation. I don't know. And Apple is notoriously secretive, so I couldn't tell you uh, exactly what they mean, but they probably like it that way. Uh, and uh, we'll finish up our discussion with uh, a quick look at NTFS, the uh, Windows file system, you know, ever since Windows NT, uh, and that's why it's NTFS. Uh, and w Windows NT, if you don't remember, predated Windows 2000, uh, XP, Vista, uh, and so on. They're all descendants of the uh, Windows NT line. Uh, and NTFS uh, is uh, used you know, for supporting large disks, and it thinks of storage on several different levels. Uh, there is the sector, there is the cluster, and there is the volume. Uh, and a sector is a chunk of disk. Uh, a cluster is a grouping of several sectors, and a volume is, you know, a, we usually think of it as drive, but it doesn't have to be. It's a virtual drive, so like C drive or D drive or something like that is a volume. Uh, that is not necessarily uh, corresponding to a physical disk. Uh, it is often the case that you know, in Windows you format one physical disk to correspond to a drive, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, your laptop is probably not like that. Uh, if you have a Windows laptop, there's probably a recovery partition and there's uh, other stuff in there, so different volumes on the same physical disk. But if you get a USB drive you know, for backups, like I just advised, uh, then one volume in that case is probably the entire disk. Now, um, the uh, cluster is the way that NTFS thinks about uh, storage. It allows the uh, implementation to not care so much about how many sectors uh, are in a cluster. So it abstracts away a little bit of the details because physical sectors uh, are determined by the hardware and not by the software. Now, the volume contains you know, your usual files, as you would expect, but also information about the file system, so all the metadata, all the overhead stuff uh, 
uh, is also stored uh, in the volume. Uh, and then, of course, unless the volume is completely full, there is some amount of free space. Uh, and the logical volume, as said, could be some part of a physical disk, all of a physical disk uh, spread across multiple physical disks. So the NTFS volume layout looks something like this, not even the slightest bit to scale because file area is uh, overwhelmingly huge as compared to everything else. Uh, but there is the boot sector. Boot sector just says, how do you um, start up uh, the operating system if there is one uh, in this partition? The master file table, some system files, uh, and then the file area, again, is where all of your actual files are stored and all of the files of the operating system and everything. So the master file table and the system files uh, are your metadata. It's the management, it's the organization of the volume. So the master file table uh, contains the information about where all your files and folders are located. So what files exist and what are their sizes and what relevant information is there about them. Uh, and the system block contains uh, a few more things. Uh, it contains MFT2, a mirror of the first few rows of the master file table in case the original is damaged. So we could you know, do a partial recovery uh, using this little backup. Uh, a log file, that's the journaling transaction log. So when we are executing a transaction, this is where we write down our list of steps that we are intending to do. Uh, cluster bitmap uh, just keeps track of which clusters are in use. So tells us about free space. Uh, and then the attribute definition table just says what uh, types of attributes uh, are supported on this volume. Attributes are things like read only, just for the sake of an example. Um, now, uh, NTFS uses journaling to make sure that the file system is always in a consistent state, even if there is a crash or a restart. Uh, and there's a service that is responsible for maintaining this log file. Uh, and the goal of recovery is to make sure that system maintained metadata is in a consistent state. Uh, user data can still get lost. So if there's a crash, you can lose work that you are working on in your text editor uh, if it was not entirely saved to disk before uh, the crash occurred. Um, you will bring your system back up in a consistent state, but user data got lost. That's a design decision on the part of Microsoft. It makes recovery operations simpler and faster to be more okay with with the idea of losing data. Uh, there's also performance implications uh, for making it less likely to lose data, um, but we'll see uh, how the implementation that's chosen is pretty common for operating systems. So there's no perfect answer. So yeah, a particular write might not have taken place because of a crash, which means, you know, sorry, you lose uh, as the user, but the system will always remain in a consistent state. Uh, but one of the things that happens uh, by, you know, putting things into the log file and then carrying them out later uh, is that sometimes things can get reordered to get better performance. So things that are higher priority can go first and uh, all that kind of stuff gets written out to disk uh, as efficiently as possible. But the actual implementation of journaling looks like this. Uh, record the changes in the log file in the cache and then modify the volume in the cache. Uh, and then the cache manager flushes the log file to disk. And only after that's complete, the volume changes are actually made on disk. So at no point, no matter when uh, an interruption occurs, can we end up in an inconsistent state? Uh, if a crash happens before step one, well, there was nothing to do, so no problem, the state was already consistent. Uh, if a crash happens during step one, between step one and two, uh, during step two or after step two, changes were made, but they were in memory only, uh, and they didn't ever get written to disk, uh, and the data that was written to disk uh, previously remains consistent. Uh, if a crash happens during step three, we'll see that there is a, a partial transaction in the log file, but no actual changes were made to disk. So we can just throw away that partial entry in the log. We know it's partial because it's missing the end transaction statement. So we know that it didn't get to the end, uh, in which case there's nothing else to do except dump that uh, log entry. If uh, we got to 
uh, step three, and that is complete, and the crash happens after that or during step four, then some changes may have occurred. Uh, and if those changes uh, have occurred, we can compare against the log file, and the log file will say, that well, this is what was supposed to happen uh, in step one, and we can see, did that happen? Yes. Uh, okay, we need to undo it. Uh, this is what happened in step two. Uh, did that happen? Yes, we need to undo it, uh, and so on until we get to the end of uh, all of the uh, events that I, all the log entries that actually happened uh, and then we can undo them uh, once that's over with uh, we uh, have put everything back to how it was before the start of the transaction we can delete the log entry uh, for this transaction because you know, it didn't happen it was rolled back uh, and then we are back at a consistent state uh, and if the crash happens after step four then all the changes from this transaction were in and we were in a consistent state again uh, and therefore nothing has really gone wrong this is like a super brief overview of transaction recovery. Uh, as I previously mentioned, this will come up again in databases. Uh, if you take databases, and that course will presumably have a much more detailed uh, description of how to roll back unsuccessful changes uh, using the log file. If you're really curious, um, I have some lecture notes uh, about it uh, that are uh, already in GitHub. Uh, it's under ECE 356, uh, and you can read uh, the uh, recovery uh, topics to get a good idea of what actually happens if you are so inclined. Um, and yeah, um, once that's happened, uh, what's really interesting is that uh, all kinds of things uh, that we have done, you know, we do a write to disk, uh, but the write to disk isn't actually um, synchronous anymore. I mean, normally we expect that we do a write and we can't go on until the write has occurred. Uh, but when we use journaling like this, the write having occurred isn't that the data is actually on disk. Uh, all that's happened is we've uh, transferred all the data over to the operating system and it has agreed that it's going to write this data out to disk soon. So the changes are carried out in the background, uh, or as we might put it, asynchronously. So a program can say that it wants to write some data, and it doesn't have to wait for the data to actually be physically on disk before it can go on to the next thing. And that's kind of interesting. Uh, and this whole idea of can we do some operations asynchronously, that is, start them and then not have to wait for them, uh, is actually, yeah, it's totally valid. And we're going to examine how to do that in our regular program in the next and really final uh, major unit of this course, which is about asynchronous I.O. So looking forward to it. See you in the next video.